Hello! Today's stories come from r slash Entitled People. Well, folks, if you are a fan of the Piercing Patty or Bucket Lady sagas, you'll be happy to hear that today we will be meeting Mad Margaret. It's an eight-part saga, and we'll be reading parts one through four in this video, where our antagonist has some obvious difficulties. It's a wild ride, but I promise that, despite what you might think through the beginning parts, you'll end up with a real soft spot for Margaret by the end. Despite the oddities, OP does an incredible job humanizing her and finding the comedy within. Let's kick it off with part one. Mad Margaret. The beginning. Three months ago. Today, I will be introducing you to a human being who is a curious mixture of entitled and insane. My first landlady, Mad Margaret. About eight years ago, I moved out of my parents' place practically a few months after returning from foreign exchange. My family is supportive, but pretty firmly believe in being autonomous and self-sufficient. So I look for a place to live near my, at the time, girlfriend, now fiancé. She lived on the outskirts of a larger city, and finding low rent would be difficult. Eventually, I find a room listed for about $500 per month, which is almost criminally low for the area. But I was a foolish child and did not pick up on that first red flag. The second red flag came when I called to query about the room. My soon-to-be landlady made sure to emphasize that she was a pastor and a minister, that no amount of Satanism or evil thoughts would be allowed in the house. I am myself completely non-religious so I foolishly believed that this would be perfectly fine. I explained that I was a student and would be doing student things. An agreement was made and I moved up shortly thereafter. Upon moving in, Mad Margaret was pleasant, if a little eccentric. She showed me to my room, my mom helped me unpack, and mom and I left to get some starting groceries. Upon our return, Mad Margaret showed me my shelf in the fridge and my shelf in the pantry. Mom and I load our stuff up and mom drives back home. Shortly afterwards, Mad Margaret apologized for leaving some of her groceries on the pantry and helped me move her stuff to a different shelf. This left all of my groceries stacked up in the middle of my shelf on the pantry because I didn't feel the need to spread them out. This is very important. My first morning in my new room, I wake up around 8 a.m. to knock, knock, knock. So I say, hey, Margaret, what's up? It's not going to work out. You need to pack your things up and leave. I'm sorry, what? You? need to leave. It's not going to work out. Well, I paid first and last month's rent, so I'm here for at least two months. What's going on? Have I offended you? I don't need any of your feng shui voodoo devil crap in my house. Note, it was not her house. She was subleasing. I don't recall doing any feng shui voodoo devil crap. What do you mean? She beckons that I follow her and stomps off to the kitchen, where she flings open the pantry and points accusingly at my shelf. This feng shui voodoo! What's wrong with my groceries? How you organize them. You have them all stacked up in the middle, like you're doing some feng shui crap to curse me and my child. Uh, no, I just left them there after we moved your groceries off my shelf yesterday. You had your stuff on the sides, so I put my stuff in the middle, and then we moved your groceries. (laughs) I've got my eye on you. That, my friends, was day one in this house. I lived there for a little over half a year. If you guys are interested, I can provide more epic tales of this mad woman. She was entitled, nuts, and pretty racist, against black people, Asian, and Hispanic people. Amusingly, she was herself black. Mad Margaret, part two, her righteous defense against the shaman and warlocks, two months ago. On to the current story. One of the mistakes I made very early on as an independent adult was to regularly offer my technical or electronic skills to anyone and everyone. It makes me feel cool and smart to fix things for people. I made this mistake with Margaret during my initial phone call setting up the rental situation. The next day, after she accused me of Satanism based solely on how I organized my groceries, she called me over to the living room. I braced myself for another rant about my evil voodoo ways. But instead, Mad Margaret asked for my help. She asked about a way to get her camcorder to stream live to the internet. I figured this was an opportunity to get on her good side, so I take the camcorder in hand and start fiddling with it, as well as her computer, to see what our options are. This was in 2013, so live streaming was nowhere near as commonplace as it is today. While playing with her outdated equipment to see if what she wanted was even possible, she began to explain why she wanted to live stream. You see, Mad Margaret has a hobby. Mad Margaret enjoys preaching daily to an empty room for about three consecutive hours, 
give or take an hour depending on her mood. I later learned that this was the safest time to enter or leave the house, as she would not stop unless God himself showed up to tell her to shut up. Margaret began telling me how desperately important it was that she do this daily. The following conversation, while possibly not identically worded as it has been nine years, has not been exaggerated in the slightest, nor is she being misrepresented. This is who this woman is. Thank you, Bailey, for helping me get this fixed up. I knew it was the right choice letting you live here. Did she forget that she accused me of Satanism yesterday? No problem. I just really enjoy fixing things. Do you know why I do this? Preaching to her empty living room behind a lectern. Every day. Because you're a minister? I was desperately hoping this was a short conversation. Because I fight daily for the protection of the world and all the good godly people here. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, there are people on the opposite side, people who work with the devil to try and bring ruin to the world. Every day there are shaman out there begging their evils to prevent the sun from rising each day. Oh? If I wasn't here preaching God's word, they would win. The sun wouldn't rise and we'd all die in a world of darkness. Yes, people, I am not exaggerating. This woman takes credit for the sun rising each day. Ah, well, thanks, I guess. Each day I speak out against these evils. You know, the other day I saw thousands of crows on your college campus. I knew they were sent by evil priests to stop my sermons. They're an evil that collects around the godless students at the college. I'm pretty certain that crows just have some kind of migration pattern up here in the fall. They do. We get tons of crows every year. No. It's them students, I tell you. I had one of those Asians staying here last year. I tried to tell him about God and Jesus, but he tried to put an evil on me for it. That's unfortunate. He had the shrine with Buddhas and evil figures. He tried to use his magic to curse my son's flight, to crash the plane and kill him. Did his plane crash? No, because I stopped it with my sermons. Neato. I've had other students from the college that you go to come here. All of them were evil. So many of them smoke the devil's lettuce and let Satan take over their body. Terrible influences on my son. Later, I would find out her other son lived in a building next door and was hands down the biggest stoner I have met in my entire life. Dude was so chill and tried to redirect his mom from harassing us anytime he was there. I'm sorry. How's the camera coming, honey? Can we get my videos online? You know, Margaret, I think that this camcorder and desktop are a little too old to be capable of doing that. I'm afraid you'll just have to keep the recordings yourself. Following this, I left for my girlfriend's house as quickly as possible. Every day for the next month, Mad Margaret would attempt to pester or harass me into fixing her up to be live online. Each time I would make an excuse to not get trapped into doing so. Relevant comments. Question. Redditor asks how old Margaret's kids are. OP. The one I met was in his early 20s, a couple years older than me at the time. Tall guy, dreads, the man smelled like a Willie Nelson concert. Super duper chill. Seemed tired beyond his years any time he existed in the same zip code as his mother. He was the younger brother. Question. I'm actually surprised that you survived and hopefully got away from the woman. So being a petty person, I would so show up in a devil suit and cab saying, Hey, I'm here to pick you up personally. Do you want to take this scenic route? OP replied, I'm not going to invite that kind of conflict in my life. She's nuts. There's no benefit to messing with her. Also, another tenant was already doing that, which is Mad Margaret and the tales of other tenants. I'm long gone from her house. Haven't seen her in years. Though, I imagine she's probably still in the same place. Apparently, she's been a menace to the town for a while. I know this because when I moved in and went to get a change of address form from the post office, the guy at the counter handed me a second one after he read the address and told me I should consider getting out of there ASAP. Someone else said, I'd mess with her if I thought she was just playing things up, but there is very definitely some kind of certifiable psychosis in that woman, and as much as I want to mess with her, I'd feel bad for harassing the mentally ill. Another comment reads, Oh, indeed, and legitimately if she is mentally ill, hopefully she can get the help she needs. I just thought that she was just some holier-than-thou crazy person that just demanded people to worship her because she thought she was great. But now that you just posted this, makes me realize maybe there's more to it. But still, if the whole town knows about her, hopefully she could get some help if something does happen in the future. OP, I'm certain it's a little bit of both. She's 20% crazy, 80% holier than thou and entitled. I'll tell you the funny stories and laugh about the situation, but I don't want to seek things out further. 
primarily because I'm 99% certain I don't want to find out why she keeps getting her driver's license taken away. Mad Margaret Part 3 The Tale of the Possessed Dog Two Months Ago Margaret is, by my estimation, at heart somewhat lonely. How do I know this? Well, two reasons. If she saw me or one of the other two tenants, and she wasn't preaching to an empty room, she would immediately attempt to hold us hostage in conversation. Seriously, no amount of mm or reallys would dissuade her from going on and on and on and on and on about how everyone besides her is evil, and she's a saint. After one week where she wasn't able to successfully pester me or the other two tenants, she out of nowhere adopted a dog. Now, it's been nearly 10 years, so I cannot remember this dog's name. But I do remember the dog. It was a small curly-haired white dog, and it was a sweetheart. This dog, when I met it, was jumping up and wanted nothing but love and affection, which it seemed at first Margaret was going to provide. She pet the dog, told her that she was a beautiful gift from the Lord, a great matchup, right? Well, before I elaborate much further, it warrants explaining the layout of the house. Mad Margaret's madhouse was at one point in its history an assisted living home. It had three bedrooms on the first floor, one for each tenant, and a whole second story dedicated entirely to her grand regal radiance, Mad Margaret. It is also worth mentioning that Mad Margaret is, if you hadn't figured it out from the other two posts, extremely mistrustful of, well, everyone. So she made a point that her fluffy white angel never be downstairs. Back to the story. For the next few days, I am, as always, careful to leave during Margaret's midday sermon to no one, as that is the only time she won't attempt to trap anyone in conversation. I noticed a bit of a trend. She kept talking about the cleanliness of God and how the devil was an agent of chaos and filth. Eventually, about a week after Mad Margaret got the dog, I was unlucky enough to return home while she was in the kitchen. She caught me. Bailey? Oh, fracking. What's up, Margaret? We need to get rid of the dog. We? Oh no, what's going on? It's possessed, I think, by Satan himself. What do you mean, it's possessed? This, forgive me, dang dog is intent on ruining my godly house. It's bringing filth into my home. Filth? It keeps defecating and urinating in my room. We need to get rid of it. Oh no, it wasn't potty trained? Those heathens at the shelter assured me that she was. Is it not going to the bathroom when you let it outside? Silence. At this point, it hits me. I had seen the dog precisely once when she had initially gotten it. I'd leave the house pretty frequently, but one would assume my path would cross with her pottying the dog at least once. Right? Margaret, you have been letting the dog outside, right? I want this demon gone. (gasps) What do you mean you want it gone? I want to take it to be put down. Um, absolutely not. Absolutely not, Margaret. Return it to the shelter. But it's possessed. The heathens at the shelter tried to put a demon in my home. Margaret, the dog is not possessed. You never let it outside. Where is it supposed to go to the bathroom? Do you expect it to stand up on the toilet, do its business, and flush? I let it out just the other day. Margaret, how often do you go to the bathroom? Every couple of days? No. Find me the number of the shelter. I'll call them for you. I don't have the number. I don't believe that. You better get your son to help you get this dog back to the shelter, because if I find out you had this dog put down because it crapped in the room you left it locked up in, you're going to have a lot more to worry about than demons in this house. I will call the cops, Animal Protective Services, anyone and everyone. Fine. I'll get my son to help me return this blasted demon. The last I saw the dog, she was loading it up into her SUV, and her son was driving. She had lost her license several times over, so I'm fairly confident the dog was taken and returned to the shelter she got it from. For the next couple of days, she was surprisingly less talkative to me, though she definitely looked at me with some suspicion. I don't think she ever stopped believing that the dog was possessed. I'm glad I was able to save it from her. Mad Margaret Part 4 Other Tenants Two months ago I've mentioned minimally in other installments of this story that there were other tenants in Mad Margaret's house. To be precise, there were two, Sad Steve and Devilish Dan. Note, names change because I have forgotten their names at this point. I'm not the type of person to really know my neighbors, and our paths seldom crossed. 
because we'd all keep to our rooms, for obvious reasons. Both of these men were a fair bit older than me, 40s to 50s, and both were semi-recently divorced, only living with Mad Margaret to be closer to their kids. Two divorcees, both alike in dignity, in fair city where we lived, where we lay our scene from ancient grudge break new shenanigans. Source, me ripping off Shakespeare. We'll start with an introduction of Sad Steve. Sad Steve was a very clever, if very depressed man. In the months I lived there, I shared two to three conversations with him. He was a set worker for a local TV show about a cop who can see supernatural fairy tale things. He was very sad about the way things went down in his life and wanted nothing more than to be there for his kids. He gave me a Mickey Mouse coffee mug I still own to this day. Now, as far as Mad Margaret was concerned, this man was a ripe target for impromptu sermons and semi-frequent snide remarks. The first time I spoke with Sad Steve in the kitchen, after chatting for a bit, Margaret came out and I very quickly finished making my food and scurried back to my room, unfortunately abandoning poor Steve. Steve was stuck in that conversation for a good two hours. The man either had the patience of a saint or just wouldn't will himself to exit the situation. She told him all about how God's got a plan for this or if you're righteous, your life won't suck, that it wasn't good, etc. The look on his face at the time broke my heart and I resolved to throw myself between Mad Margaret and Sad Steve anytime she started focusing on him. It felt like I was leaping on top of a grenade each time, but I'm fairly emotionally resilient, and honestly, I thought too much exposure to Margaret would drive Steve to a bad place. Now, the other tenant there is someone that you've probably all been dying to hear about, Devilish Dan. Why do I assume your collective interest in Devilish Dan? Well, this man has acted out and personified just about every action you guys recommended I take. Dan hated Mad Margaret, and Mad Margaret hated him right back. These people were arch enemies in the most literal sense possible. Where I saw someone to be avoided for the sake of avoiding unnecessary inconvenience or drama, Devilish Dan saw a wacko with religious delusions who could be messed with. Devilish Dan would laugh devilishly. Devilish Dan would outright claim to be Satan there to torture her. Devilish Dan would get into shouting matches with Mad Margaret because he apparently does not see the futility in arguing with crazy. Devilish Dan would slam his door and claim to be the Antichrist. Devilish Dan was surprisingly childish for a 50-plus-year-old man with graying hair. While I disagreed with his tactics, his presence outside of his room was much appreciated because Mad Margaret would fixate on him because he'd actively antagonize her which made any time he was roaming the house a safe time for me to go about my business unperturbed. A brief example of a typical interaction between the two. Dan, are you trying to curse my son? I saw you looking at him with evil eyes when you were getting out of your car. Of course I was. What? Why? Why do you attack my family? Because I'm the devil incarnate, you stupid cow. Loud, angry rambling ensues. After a particularly bad night between the two, I was roused from my computer science homework by particularly loud slamming down the hallway. I decided to wait a bit for things to calm down, then took my laundry to the laundry room, which was right next to Devilish Dan's room, down the hallway. I find Mad Margaret's practically Rastafarian son in the hallway staring at Devilish Dan's bedroom door, laundry in hand, shaking his head. On Devilish Dan's door, in white paint, in large, horror movie font, was the message, don't threaten me. By Rastafarian, I mean her son was a tall black dude. Remember, Margaret's racist against black people, excluding only herself and her sons, who had dreadlocks, wore a Bob Marley jersey, and smelled like a Willie Nelson concert. She also hated people who smoked pot. It is a cruel irony that this incredibly chill dude was born to Mad Margaret. Good Lord, people, I wish I had taken a picture. Mad Margaret's son had come over to pick up his laundry out of the dryer only to find the message on the door. He yelled to Mad Margaret, Mom, I'm serious, you can't be doing this junk anymore, you're going to get in trouble, which was met with some shrieking about how devilish Dan was the devil. I quickly got the lowdown from the sun. Devilish Dan doubled down on his devilish depiction. Mad Margaret, met with much misanthropy, momentarily melted down. This was also, apparently, not Mad Margaret's first time using this means of communication, so her son was concerned she'd be met with the police. Now, for those of you who are cheering on Devilish Dan, I do want to take a moment to clarify. This is not necessarily just how he acted with Margaret. The man was a pretty rude narcissist, 
pinning the blame for all of his life's woes on Mad Margaret and his ex-wife. When I was looking for another room to rent, I met two lovely women in the neighborhood who had rooms, one of which I did move into, and both had also had applications from Devilish Dan. Both of these women made it very clear that they did not see him in a favorable light and that he had been angrily ranting about how everything bad was Margaret's fault, taking no responsibility for himself. Ultimately, at the end of this tale, I remain concerned for sad Steve, and I hope he did well and got out of there. I feel little pity for devilish Dan and assume that if he remained there for much longer, one would have murdered the other. Personally, I'm just glad to have left. Relevant Comments I like to think that Mad Margaret and Devilish Dan were each other's karmic paybacks. OP. They were, in a way, made for each other. I do hope you enjoyed part one of the Mad Margaret saga. Tomorrow will be part two, where we will be reading stories five through eight, and it won't disappoint. I think this house sounds like quite the eventful place, but I do love these sagas about entitled people. I found Mad Margaret's response to the groceries hilarious. Let's check out the comments where I was surprised to find some wisdom, appreciating the balanced presentation of this saga. Buttermellow said, I'm very distracted by the thought that Sad Steve may have worked on the set of Grimm. Green Oribus said, same. That sounds like the show, and that also means that this took place in Portland. From what I've heard, Portland is a weird place, and I bet that Mad Margaret took that as confirmation that everything was demonic. Hard Tyrant Dinosaur said, um, can we introduce Mad Margaret to the Bucket Woman, please? Preferably in Australia. Sorry, Oz. From one thing OP said, I'm pretty sure I know where OP was living, and I'd rather Mad Margaret versus the Bucket Woman occur somewhere far, far away from there. As long as we can get video. Someone else added, God, I love the Bucket Woman's stories. I mean, it would suck to be living it, but darn, it makes me laugh. Someone said, this is my favorite best of Reddit because OP takes the time to highlight in a whole update post how Mad Margaret is in some ways a good person. And as much as I enjoy scrolling through the Karen and Entitled, This and That, and Just No forums, it's incredibly nice and refreshing to see the duality presented because no one is inherently 100% evil. Someone else added, that's what I've been saying for so long. For some reason, people on here forget that people in the real world aren't 100% evil, so it's always bothered me that so many antagonists in these posts feel like villains you see in fiction, that they are 100% evil with not a redeemable bone in their body. I get that most of these posts are fiction, but I like to pretend that they aren't. If you've enjoyed the story and would like to hear more, consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Thanks, and bye for now.